My name is Sean Robinson, and I'm the publisher at Living Line Books. I'm also an illustrator, and uh, today I am happy to be talking to uh, two of my favorite correspondents. Those two people are Eddie Campbell and Carson Gruba, two phenomenal cartoonists. Uh, first off, Eddie, on the little box to my right here, is a, uh, a comics polymath, a very sensitive and uh, skilled illustrator who's been working on both his own material and interpreting others' materials uh, for 40 years now. I mean, just a tremendous career, uh, tremendous backlog of uh, very interesting, very diverse books, uh, a few of which I uh, just got the pleasure of uh, reading this week, um, catching up a little bit on uh, the past few years of his output, and uh, just a um, you know wonderful writer, hilarious and incisive and sometimes darkly funny, and uh, also an insightful critic. I think it's a very rare package. And although he's written and uh, drawn a host of interesting books, it's last year's re-release of the uh, seminal graphic novel From Hell that I thought we might talk about today. This is a book that was originally serialized and drawn in the 1990s in uh, Taboo magazine at first and was collected and completed several years later, uh, written by Alan Moore. And one of the many books that uh, Mr. Campbell has received basically every industry award for, well-deserved. Eddie, are you there? Right. Can you hear me? I can. I can hear you. I've been, here, you... For, I've been here for 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I, I've been here for seven minutes. Uh, I, I was looking forward to seeing your, uh, your lovely face, but uh, I don't know if it's going to happen anytime soon. Technology. <laughs> We're going to be talking about two books simultaneously. So Eddie is one of the uh, two people who we're talking to right now. And the other one is Carson Grubaugh, who is a award-winning photorealist painter. He's uh, exhibited paintings all over the world. And he's also the co-illustrator and co-author of The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, which was a pet project written and drawn by Dave Sim, who worked on this project for almost a decade. And this book will soon be available from Living the Line Books. He's also a full-time instructor of art at Shelton State Community College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And I wanted to talk about both of these books together because I thought that they kind of spoke to each other in interesting ways and are both fairly interesting examples of the possibilities and sort of maybe even undeveloped possibilities of the graphic novel and different things that can be done with the medium. So. Eddie, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what prompted the new edition of From Hell, sort of what the starting point was for this new edition of the book. Well, the old one has now been in print for 20 years. And um, uh, keep, keeping a book in, in the market and always involves a bit of uh, maintenance. You know, like you, you, you have to... You have to tend to your garden every now and then. With with books, you 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 have to occasionally put a new cover on them or uh, frame them in a in a somewhat different way to keep to keep it alive in the market. Um, it was twenty years. I I, I, I we should do something with it. And I I don't think really recently in the last ten years become comfortable with the idea of coloring on the computer. I, I've never liked it in the past. I've never liked comic book coloring. I always found it hideous, hideous to behold. And it took me a while, it took me several years to find a way of doing it that I was happy with, a, a way that that I, I, I felt it expressed my own ideas about color. Uh, and um, so I undertook to, to, <laughs> to, color the, the whole 600 page work of From Hell from beginning to end. It also gave me a chance to fix mistakes that, that, that have been in it for since the beginning. Because when you're turning a book out on a, you know, a periodical basis, you can't go back and fix what you did in the previous one. Um, and, and we did to an extent when we gathered it all together, but uh, there was a rush to get it out because of that, that awful movie <laughs> that, <laughs> that, was, um, that was coming up. So we were in a hurry to get it out. Anyway, this, this, this gave me the opportunity to fix things 
like the the carriage that they drive around and is not entirely consistent from from chapter to chapter and and I made it so things like that um I was I was surprised that the that the way that it's been discussed is that it's a colorization but um actually having the books side by side I mean you've done a fair amount of redrawing uh I mean I would say that at virtually every page that I looked at side by side had a certain amount of uh you know rejiggering of the facial expression or a slight perspective yeah. changes sometimes it's just um sometimes it's just cuz the head was too small you know I've had to I've, I've got the head back to, into a a, a more realistic proportion. Hmm. I think the mistake that I made, because you know, because our people today, our generation, our generations, <laughs> since <laughs> I must be twenty years older than you, but our generations, um, we, we're not used to drawing hats, and there's a tendency, I think, to draw the head and the hat at, as a unit and to measure it as though it were just the head. Like like the the head is either six or seven uh, part yeah sixth or seventh part of a of a total figure. I think I made the mistake of cl- including the hat in there, <laughs> which, mm. meant, which meant, <laughs> I was, you know what I mean. You're an artist yourself. Um, you really, you should. What you've got to do. If, if I was telling a student, I'd say you draw the head, make sure the head's in proportion, and then put the hat on it. But this. <laughs> This, I do all this stuff what, 30 years ago, most of it. Um, if I could tell my younger self now, <laughs> draw the head before you put the hat on it. <laughs> the, the scene with the, the, the first meeting in the tavern with the, with the girls and one of them is wearing a hat. That was one of the things that jumped out at me is um, at every single uh, face with, the, with that particular hat was, uh, seemed to be redrawn. Uh, I, was, I was wondering if the the style of hat was the objective uh, or the. Uh, no, the, I think I think you're talking about. I I, I get one of them. The character Liz Stride. I felt I hadn't done her justice. Hmm. I felt I hadn't in in creating these these characters or you know envision envisioning the characters, each of which at the time we had uh, maybe one photo to work with, and it was the the coroner's photograph, you know, it was the photo of a dead body right. that I had to reimagine as a living person. And that created some problems. So I, I, I redid Liz Stride from scratch, really reconsidered her as, a, as an individual. Um, we're talking, of course, about the, if, if any of you listening in doesn't know, the uh, the Whitechapel murders, the, the story of Jack the Ripper, the the great horror classic of of English popular culture. Um, Alan, thirty years ago, he decided he wanted to do a murder. That's the way he tells it, and then he's quick to say, "I don't mean to do a murder. I I mean to uh, examine a murder as, as an author rather than do one as a killer." And he he looked at several murders, and he. Th- his first thought was that Jack the Ripper, Jack the Ripper, the the Whitechapel murders was was overworked, overdone, had had been looked into too many times by too many different people. But he felt that that actually was what made it interesting, the uh, the phenomenal encrustation of theory and and uh, side like characters that is accrued to the the, the central story. Um, in fact, we, we finished it by doing a 24 page appendix in comics form in which we make fun of all the Jack the Ripper theories, including <laughs> our own. Uh, that, uh, incrustation of, uh, detail is one of the things that I thought was a commonality with, uh, the book that, uh, that, uh, you know, we're going to be putting out, uh, in the beginning of August, um, uh, among among the details being the the sort of nonfiction usage of of uh, incredibly well researched non fictional elements to create something that is you know sits and again it's about a, a death that's never been completely explained right so um, right? these these things attract this kind of work I think uh, the, the the death that still still has room for uh, the creation of the 
the entire story around it. There's, we don't know enough about the the death of Alex Raymond. Well, the, will you, yeah, will you tell us about that, uh, Carson? A little bit about the uh, genesis of the book. The death and, of yeah, Alex I, yeah, exactly. Give us the secret, Carson. <laughs> can you can you hear me on this mic? Should, I can. I can hear you just fine. Okay, good. This is weird though because I'm hearing myself twice now. Um, the Strange Death of Alex Raymond is a book that Dave Sim started. He started the project when he was working on his book Glamour Puss. Um, and he, he was just researching the history of photorealism art in comics. And very quickly, one of the big stories in that lineage is the death of Alex Raymond behind the wheel of a fellow cartoonist's car out on a joyride. Um, Stan Drake's car and there's just multiple conflicting accounts similar to what Eddie's describing in From Hell there's this massive amount of accounts to draw from and Dave starts seeing these conflicts and wonders you know why are there these conflicting stories and that spun off into the book we're doing where he just really goes down the rabbit holes of the research and uh, this is an interesting you're talking about the incrustation of facts around the Jack the Ripper case. Um, in this case, I feel like Dave is the one pulling, he's he's the only one doing the kind of research that all the Ripper allergists does, but he manages to encrust as much metatextual <laughs> information as all the Ripper allergists seem to have done for Jack the Ripper, and then builds a story and a narrative and a theory about what's going on there. Right. And uh, Dave had drawn about 180 pages of this book uh, over a uh, three and a half year period. And it was originally going to be a book, a series of uh, comics, and then a series of graphic novels. And it was originally going to be coming out from uh, IDW. Uh, but at a certain point uh, that he was working on that, his he developed a tremor in his uh, drawing hand uh, uh, that was basically any time that he did any type of very fine line work, it's like a hitch in his wrist. Uh, that uh, caused him incredible pain and basically has kept him from being able to draw at the level that um, you know he had created for this book. Uh, so the first portion of the book is really a performative, uh, is a performance in a sense where he is attempting to teach himself to draw like these photorealists uh, while unraveling the details about um, Alex Raymond's death. And then Carson, um, when Dave had been basically laid up with this injury for a couple months. Uh, you contacted him through the the Moment of Cerebus blog, is that correct? Yeah, hold on. I'm, I'm sorry for that echo there. I was trying to get off of the the one device and onto the other device here without causing audio <laughs> issues. Um, yeah, apologies for that. Uh, yeah, Dave's wrist went out and I contacted him through the blog and said, I, you know, I think I can mimic what you were doing a little bit and just a couple trial and error pages. And yeah, he, he let me go forward with the project from there. And then when he decided that he would no longer work on it, for whatever reason, he gave me permission to um, publish what had been done. And he had already been encouraging me to publish some of the metatextual resonances I was seeing that, you know, related to my experience with the book as a separate book, which I, I think I had been thinking of actually, Eddie, as a similar thing to the flight of the goal catchers as like this, this addendum that you just stick on the end. Yeah. Um, I was planning on doing maybe a 48 page book or something. And Dave was kind of aware of that material. And I told him I'd like to, you know, end the book with that and then just wrap it up. And he said, you have my blessing. And you know, that was awesome. So that's, that's the book that's coming out is everything Dave and I did together and then like bridging that into my addendum and then ending and trying to make a complete package out of it. Yeah, e Eddie, the, the books uh, are interesting in that structurally they don't really, they're almost the opposite in, in that, um, you know, the it seems to me that From Hell, uh, in a certain respect, even though it's extremely formally challenging and, and, and stakes out a lot of, you know, really unique territory, especially visually, uh, it, it's a it's more of a detective novel in the sense that you you drill down in, into a solution uh you, you take this sort of larger form and then and then come to a point whereas it seems to me that strange death uh sort of takes the point 
and then goes outward uh, from it. It's like the ever expanding uh, structure. Yes, I, I think from has got has a similar aspect to that because Alan um, Alan Alan's vision of, of of what he was doing was tracing the ripples that 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 were, were set in motion by the event, you know, ripples sociological, criminological, philosophical and so on uh, all the way down to the present time um and um and the interesting thing about the the thing i like about the the uh, the dave sim book the alex raymond book is the uh, alex raymond and uh, stan drake shared a uh, a style. They were they were proponents of a, a style of comics that has disappeared entirely. It's disappeared out of the newspapers, or even the the, the ones that remained there were so banal and uh, drawn by third or fourth generation artists after the originals had passed on. But it's it's a style of comics that. Um, existed for a, a two or three decades two or three decades four maybe which we were which days referring to as the photorealist style right. and they they figured a way of um getting very realistic and glamorous pictures onto the page uh, in in a swift manner because in the comic strip everything has got to be swift there isn't the time or space to to, to be elaborate and and Drake and Raymond were the the leading participants, the leading proponents, as I say, of this style. And in order to recreate their story, Dave has gone to the extreme of mastering their work, of being able to imitate the work of each of them and of others besides, and. Uh, Often he hasn't just traced this. He's 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 drawn it afresh. I've I've compared original and and Dave Sim versions because you can't just trace this. Why the style has a certain panache and exuberance that can only be attained by uh, a, a dynamic attack with with the pen and ink and or the brush because uh, the brush is the the dominant tool in this style. And Dave is not a brush man. Dave really had to learn this style from scratch, really, of, of drawing everything with the brush. Back when I was hanging out with Dave the few times that I, I met up with him, uh, he was very much a, a croquel man. Right. And uh, he's had to learn a, a completely different technique here. Yeah, yeah Carson is, talked about Dave uh, discussing uh, Drake is a, a looking like Zorro uh, when he was inking. Yeah, <laughs> Drake, like when we're recreating the images for the book, and Sean, me and you have talked about this a number of times on the YouTube channel we do where we recreate art, but there is uh, um, a wildness to an artist like Stan Drake that, Eddie, you're exactly right. You can't trace it. Uh, Alex Raymond, I found a little bit easier to trace. He has a steadier, slower hand. But Drake, you're like, there's no way I can capture the spirit of Drake if I get each line accurate in its place, the same amount of lines with the same changes in thickness. It just doesn't work. Uh, you could it, say that it's, it's very daunting. Drake is very daunting in that way. Whereas someone like Leonard Starr, I found it, like Leonard Starr is extremely traceable and you can preserve the look. Alex Raymond somewhere in between Al Williamson gets some of the wildness, but it's fairly traceable still. And then Stan Drake and those guys that come after him get way harder, like Neil Adams and Bill Sienkiewicz. But I like the comparison to Zorro. Zorro uh, carving his, his letter Z with his uh, with the end of his sword. Zip, zip, zip. Yeah. But you, you have a, a quite a bit of that in uh, your drawing in From Hell. Uh, Eddie, the finishing that is uh, that sort of 
mark making as an event that occurred. Yeah, I don't. I, 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 I'm trying to. I, I guess similar approach in in drawing events of a hundred years ago. I wanted to evoke the the pen style of a hundred years ago. The the, the liberated pen of, of fly, f- fine cross etching and uh, again with a it has to have a certain panache it has to it, the, the style of Charles Dana Gibson for instance is yes. I'm not saying I have anywhere near that quality but uh, the, the looseness and it, it almost looks like it's landed on the page entirely as a force of nature rather than a man carefully plotting lines right gibson will draw a bouquet of flowers like he's he's dropped some you know ink onto the paper and happens to have arranged it for you 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 will draw storm clouds uh you know like like you you saw an insect on the on the paper that you're attempting to kill with your with your uh, nib uh, <laughs> yeah yes the uh the, 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 when, yeah, when I had an opportunity to, usually, usually as you see, storm clouds, usually it was an effect of nature that, that would give me an opportunity to do something like that. Um, the clouds or the, uh, yeah, or, uh, or the sea or something. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, I think of that, that opening shot of the uh, gull, uh, the, in from hell of the gull on its back. So the dead, the dead Eddie, I'm I'm curious because you did mention the the similarities between the two books. Um, when I when I was thinking about this panel, the most interesting thing to me was that both authors, both Dave and Alan, do play like a James Joyce game of expanding the one little thing they're looking at, and then expanding it to encompass all of reality. Um, and I found it, I mean, I, maybe I had a little bit more of a task than you, but I found that a bizarre way to have to think about the world while working on the project. Um, you know, that everything connects to everything else in this top down way. And I'm, I'm wondering when you were working on from hell, like what was your engagement with that ever expanding aspect of it to all of reality? Or was it enough for you to just say that that was the script and, you know, I'm just going to draw the thing. Um, ever expanding when um, when Alan when Alan started the book when he got me on board, he said it was um, it was going to be 16 parts of eight pages each. <laughs> the first parts was eight pages, and the second one was 12. The third one was 32, and I think we got up to one chapter that was 58 pages because because he. He felt that he, having promised 16 parts, he had to keep it to 16. And he, have he thought of, and as the idea just kept expanding in his head, he he would just make each chapter longer to fit the information in. He couldn't add new chapters. Um, and and it, the story just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and Dave Sim, I think Dave Sim was the, of, of all the, the artists working in comics, writer artists working in comics, Dave Sim had the biggest idea for, um, what was it with his several thousand pages of his service, the artwork, um, and, and from hell, 600 pages, with, including 58 pages of footnotes. Um, but, and the, uh, the, the Alex Raymond book's big too. What have we got, 300 pages there, is it? Yeah, that's the uh, that that's the final the final length. Yeah, um, it's a three hundred and twenty page uh, publication, but uh, about about three hundred and four pages, three hundred and five yeah. pages of comic. Yeah, but I I I, I remember one of my favorite uh, things Dave Sim said was that uh, it's not really a, it's not really about the size of the the thing. Although he was always boasting about how big his was, but it wasn't <laughs> the size of the thing. It's more about its completeness. It, it's all there. That's it. It's complete. It, it goes no further. It, there are no sequels. 
and the, and the line he used was he said, you, you, after the brothers Karamazov, you don't get the cousins and nephews Karamazov. <laughs> after, after war and peace, you don't get more war, more peace. The, the thing is complete. It, so the, the idea of a graphic novel with, with, was a, in this conversation was a thing that would be complete it, because comics are always number one in a series and the, the series knows no end until until it's not selling anymore. But to create a comic which is a, a complete self-contained thing with a beginning and an end is more important than the size of it. And it seems like from a library uh, context, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, aspect to it. I mean, you... One of the things of, of the, the graphic novel era is that uh, we now have libraries involved and uh, the graphic novel is a theme seen as a thing uh, that is wor worth reading that, that uh, where, where children was what were once it was the, the once anger and outrage that children were reading comics is now a thing that is encouraged and graphic uh, the graphic novel is on library shelves all over the world and considered considered a, a healthy idea to, to 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 encourage children's reading i think it's a great thing well i think and, these books are both similar in the heavy annotations you, you all have that printed in the book um dave dave's annotations are the the book would be <laughs> it wouldn't <laughs> he wouldn't be able to print it it wouldn't hold itself together so he's still working on even though he's given up the comic aspect of the project, he's still working on the annotations project as a website with his original research assistant, Eddie Kana. So the, I think there's a similarity between those those books in that way. And I don't, I mean, I guess there's a few other books that do that. But to me, that strikes me as um, something interesting for the more literary crowd as well. You know, I, re I remember being in college and having to go buy annotation books, books for things that we were reading. And I think books where the creators are making their own annotations just are going to make that process more interesting. Yeah. Comics with annotations. It seemed like a, seemed like a, a wild idea at the time. <laughs> Another interesting thing, I, I, I realize we're talking about very serious and serious and contemplative books here, both of these. Uh, there's much lighter fare out there, but um, a, a thing about the, the From Hell when when they turned it into when they turned it into a movie, they had to kind of dumb it down. And I thought we're in a new age here where you have to dumb down a comic to make a <laughs> a movie. <laughs> of kind of dumb it down. They were like all the way dumbed it. It's like a totally different story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, I, it would. It would. Either of those books is is. Uh, I mean, that's what makes it so interesting, right? When you're pushing it to something that, like, go ahead, try and film this. Go ahead, try and make a TV show of this. Go ahead and try and make a book of this. Um, I, yeah, I, I think you guys were at the forefront of of that, and now we're kind of reaping the benefits of that. Oh, yeah, it's been a long. It's been a long haul. It, it's uh, we did wonder at the time how long this thing would last. I remember I, Alan was was always mad at he was always mad at DC because they'd kept the book in print, you know, from Watchmen because they'd kept Watchmen in print and everybody else would say, "But well, that's what we want. We want, we want book. A, a regular writer said to me, he said, "You know, in, in in the world of regular books, they go out of print, but I look at comics." Comic, all, all these comics are just never they're kept in print all the, forever and ever. It's like, it seems that all of them are kept in print. And um, I remember Alan was mad at because the rights were supposed to revert to Alan and Dave when the book went out of print. And it's never been, Watchmen has never been out of print in um, what, 35, 35 years. So. It's what you want, isn't it? You want a book that you you want somebody to be tending to it and keeping it, keeping it there. A bit, uh, but that's another story. <laughs> well, it's it's been a, a quite. You a, guys, 
And you guys are doing a good job keeping, um, uh, Sean, keeping um, Dave Sint's books in print, being the, the steward of that pro project. That's, well, uh, well thank you. Thing. It's been it's been quite the pro it's been quite the project. Um, uh, so in addition to being a publisher, I've been um, uh, working with Dave to restore uh, his Cerebus project, all six thousand pages of it uh, from original art and negatives. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been uh, quite the journey so far. Yeah. The switch to uh, the switch to digital was a big uh, hurdle for us to get over. When we, we, Dave and I, we thought it would just be enough to preserve the neg the original negatives. We, we thought we thought that would do it, and of course, negatives don't keep. Well, I, somebody told me, he said, "You know those, you know those things don't keep. They de they deteriorate as a hug to the damn it." Um, so, so the the. Uh, reconfiguring of these things for the digital age was a big step. Is that what you're working from on the remastering of From Hell? You are you have scans of the negatives that then you're converting? We, that's another long story. The, the negatives were scanned back in 2006 when the, the original printer went out of business, uh, the Canadian printer, while, while, while it was sitting on the negatives and we had to we had, we had, he already owed us uh, money, a huge amount of money. We had 20,000 bucks, I think it was. We paid him for the book, which now wasn't going to get printed. We'd given him in, in bands. Uh, we now had to give him some more money to go and uh, sneak the, the negatives out of the, the printing plant uh, under cover of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Held in receivership, right? Yeah, so the, where the receiver wouldn't see, and for, out from under the nose of the receiver, and then drive them to a new place in Canada where we were going to, um, I can't remember the names of the different players in this, where we would be able to get them scanned. For, I, uh, I, I could say what the, uh, the names are, but uh, I, I think since we're uh, <laughs> implicating them in criminal behavior on the behalf of artists, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I, you probably had the same thing with Dave's because he had the same printer. Um, so we had to get over. We had to completely reconfigure the book for this, for the digital age, uh, which was a big step, a, a huge undertaking expense and expense. But then you've been doing all that too. It's been a, a quite a relief actually to work on Strange Death of Alex Raymond and actually have access to all of the artwork <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> yeah. But um, we 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 are butting up under our our uh, hard hard time uh, deadline here. We got about six minutes left, um, and I, I had promised that uh, we could get some questions from participants, uh, and so I'm hoping that people might have a few questions for us now. Otherwise, we can spend six minutes talking about how we could continue to talk for an hour, uh, had we the time, because uh, I feel like we barely scratched the surface here. But does anybody have a question for us? We've got okay. a very pleasant comment in the chat. <laughs> Let's shut up, bitch. OK, well, sure. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Is that is that, was is that comment ALA appropriate? I, don't, I, don't, I feel like I feel like that shouldn't. You get the librarian shoosh on that one. Where are the quotes? I haven't seen them. Um, I I uh, was just um, blown away, Eddie, by uh, I, if anybody's listening to this and is not. Oh, what are each of you hoping readers will take from your book? <laughs> Who wants, to, who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> readers. I always imagine that I'm the reader. I, 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 I can never picture more than one reader. When I go to conventions, I'm always horrified to find that there are other readers re reading, me, <laughs> reading my books. I thought, I thought I was the only one. So I can go, go back to the publisher and say, Oi, there are other people reading this. You've got to pay me more. <laughs> They've been looking you over the show, uh, looking over your shoulder the whole time. Uh, Car Carson, what how what uh, are people going to take away from the Strange Death of Alex Raymond? I think there's multiple audiences for the Strange Death of Alex Raymond that could each take something different away. One of my biggest hopes and one of the things I'm most excited for 
being involved in like the ALA and hoping that this book gets into lots of libraries and um, particularly something that I would hope that gets into like academic context at some point because it is metatextual and that kind of practice of literary criticism is is kind of endless and the book has that kind of deconstructionist component to it. I really hope there's an audience out there that has like this ever expanding reinterpretation of the book. Um, right. So that's that's one thing because the book has that in its nature. I think another audience and one of the reasons I'm so excited it's actually being published and on shelves and not just something we did on Kickstarter was the the chance that some future Dave Sims, some future Carson Grubaugh who appreciates this type of style will stumble across it and get sucked in and maybe revive the style a little bit. And then the thing that I took from the project that I, I hope that future artist takes away as well is um, you can sacrifice your life. And I don't mean just like in a crash, but the, this kind of project and this kind of style can be all consuming. And um, I've learned over the course of it to not let it totally consume me. And I, I hope that they get that from it too. push the limits, um, but don't don't lose your entire life for the, for the sake of the, the project. Let it bolster your life. So I know there's other audiences as well, but those are the three main ones right. that that I'm interested in. Yeah, and it, one, of, one of the things that was compelling to me about bringing the book to the book market, which is a tremendous undertaking for, you know, a small publisher, um, is that the that whole era of art is unrepresented, underrepresented, let's say, in uh, both public discourse about comics, but also underrepresented in terms of how great it was visually and how you know, it doesn't particularly look that way necessarily in uh, contemporaneous, you know, the, the book editions of it are not necessarily um, as flattering to the art. And, uh, you know, similarly, uh, Dave Sim, you know, put together this tremendous uh, comic over a 26 year period that's basically unavailable outside of the direct comics market. Um, very underrepresented in terms of uh, bookstores and things like that. And it was an interesting thing to see um, a complete work, uh, a complete shorter work by someone who is a, you know, sort of a marathon man in the comic scene, but is a maybe less known outside of the, uh, the other market. And um, yeah. Uh, I think that's another audience actually, Sean, uh, the, the historical side of it. I, I think that there's an academic audience for that too, not just the literary critics, but um, the, the comic historians. And also liter literary historians, because of a lot of the stuff Dave digs up in his research about the potential blackmailing of Margaret Mitchell. Um, so right. I think that there's there's a, a his historical audience there for you know for the book as well, which I I would love to see that stuff if it gets published. Send it to me. Right. I'd love to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, what are you working on right now? That you can tell us about. I'm working on a, a new book, a new book about the the COVID year. It's called The Second Fake Death of Eddie Campbell by Eddie <laughs> That's the whole title. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's about the, 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 the wearing of masks and, and the growing of one's hair. We, we, nobody looks like who they're supposed to be. The, the, the opportunities for, for skull, for the, this year's own brand of skullduggery are many and nefarious. My new graphic novel. It's a fantastic title, and you're going to drive some copy, uh, you know, so, some uh, ca copy catalogers nuts uh, with that one, <laughs> which I very much approve of. Yeah, thanks. Um, working away on that. Uh, anybody who's uh, listening now who have not uh, checked out uh, Eddie's collaboration with uh, Darren White, the playwright. If you're looking for a lighter side of uh, Eddie Campbell and you find uh, your, your From Hell um, Master Edition uh, fairly heavy read, uh, the playwright is just fantastic, Eddie. I'd never read it before this week and uh, just absolutely blown away. Um, and some of the panel transitions and some of the way that you comment on the, the, the 
text, the the friction between the text and the image. I mean, just fantastic work. Uh, so, Why, thank you, Sean. Thank you. I'm ten. I'm ten years too late. I know, but I wanted to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think we still. It's there's still copies in the warehouse, I believe. Ashley, are we um, still live here? Yeah, it looks like we're still running. We did have another question. Um, how long did Eddie spend tweaking the new edition? Oh, two years. And did you feel like this was a, a, a coloring job or you really, you really, I mean, felt like um, this was putting I, it to I, rest? I, 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 think, I think as one gets older, um, the, the the raging ongoing desire to be continually creating new stuff it is is overtaken by a, a sensibility about the the state of the stuff you've already created and um, how can I tidy this up and, and and make it more durable for for the decades ahead when I might not be here to look after it so. I wanted it to be the best possible version of the book that it could be without without redoing it. There's always the opportunity of, or the t temptation to redo the com thing completely. I know Dave was always again. Okay. Dave would never, Dave Sim would never change anything when he reprinted his books. He would never allow himself to go down that rabbit hole because there would be no end to it. If you started changing one thing, you'd you'd have to redraw the whole book. So, so the project is one of tidying up and, and fixing. And apart from which, I, I don't think I can draw better now necessarily than I could 20 years ago. Right. Different. Um, I, I, I think we're at our most original at, at a certain age and we spend the rest of our time trying to keep people from realizing that we've we're no longer we're no longer as original as we used to be. How can I how can I keep people from realizing this? Hmm. We've we've got um, some other questions here. Uh, Craig Fisher, hi Craig, uh, says Eddie is your in process work and its emphasis on masks on multiple selves a sequel to Fate of the Artist? Ah, it is a, it is definitely a sequel to Fate Fate of the Artist being the first fake death of Eddie Campbell. This and this new book is um, themes and characters from that first book turn up here. In fact, we're, we're, I'm just weighing out whether to print the two together in one volume because I'm I'm going through fate. I'm I'm doing a revision of that as well. I'm tidying that one up. We've got I've got the rights back to reprint that, and whether to reissue them as two separate books or as one volume. I'm weighing that one up right now. Well, I'm waiting for the trilogy, The Strange Death of Eddie Campbell. That the be... Strange Death of Eddie Campbell. <laughs> you have to draw that one because that one will be real, I, I presume. Yeah, where we just go back and we see all the all the resonances of the first two books. <laughs> all the clues were here. If only we'd noticed. If only we'd looked hard enough. Yeah. We could find all the clues in the first two books. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the strange obsess obsession with death that we have, though? What? what what is this? What what is what is missing from our lives that uh, we're contemplating death to such an extent? There's the next question. That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, like all of us as as humans, or like us in particular with these projects. Just you and me doing these books. Um, I, I, death is know, the subject of every one of the, that we've mentioned so far. Yeah, I I don't actually worry about it so much i think what i worried about and where where i kind of my call to the future generations uh, um is where am i going to be right before i die like what state will my life be in and how full will it be um at the end i don't know as i've been getting old as i was younger it was all about sacrifice everything for the art um, as I'm getting older and I'm watching my father have a very fulfilling life as a retired man with two kids who are doing well and a granddaughter, um, 
I think about that more like the, the being dead doesn't bother me too much. And it, the process of dying obviously could be painful and terrible, but I, I, I think more about, you know, that that's how I'm thinking about it. So I don't know. I, I got, I got uh, saddled with a book about death. It's not an obsession for me, at least I don't think. <laughs> Good for you. I was once under a general anesthetic and I came out of it thinking, well, that, that was a complete blank. I, I, that must be what like being dead is like. It, it's like from here on, it's just a blank. And it sounds yeah. sorry, dead, because you, you, you're not anything. <laughs> you have no you have no feelings about it one way or that. You're gone. Which sounds quite good to me. Like I like napping, so <laughs> I've never been particularly distressed. But it's interesting. Uh, again, I. I don't know what your worldview is, but I we've both worked with creators who have a very metaphysical view of things, um, different religious affiliations. But Dave's picture of death, as far as I've taken it, is that when you die here, you move on to the next chessboard up and that it's not like your reward in heaven that it's just a game that gets harder and then you die there and then you move up to the next level and it gets harder and it gets harder and i i don't think he sees any into that process and that sounds like a totally <laughs> miserable thing so as, as someone who sees no like higher dimension to move up to to me death yeah it sounds like a nice nap so I'm cool yeah I, yeah i was going to say there um of dave i thought that sounds like a uncommonly optimistic thought for Dave to be having. And then as you developed that, I realized no, no, it's, it's horrifying. There is no escape. No, well, you just become a chess master and then you have to then go master like eighth dimensional chess. And then you have to master master 10th dimensional chess and uh, yeah. stressful. Well, I think you could argue that the impulse to draw on itself um, outside of whatever aesthetic pleasure that you might have for it is an attempt to make some kind of eternal life for yourself or at least a extended life uh a pub printing a book publishing words and pictures that you made seems like an optimistic <laughs> method of you know uh secondhand uh continuation it's a it's an unbearably hopeful thing to do <laughs> to, to, to hope that uh, to communicate with with your fellow man and in the in the face of all the signs that, that nobody wants to know nobody cares <laughs> you should go to the trouble of making a book as a as a well eddie you, you said earlier thing. Eddie, you said that you think of yourself as the reader that you don't yeah. And, yeah. and so i'm i'm curious about that because i've spent a, a, a most of my artistic career just doing things for myself and if they get published or they get bought or they get into a gallery wall um like that's cool but i've always done art as a way of answering questions or asking questions solving problems for myself i wonder if you're kind of on the same thing where you say you're talking to yourself as a reader or do you feel more obligation to that larger audience that connection to someone else like does that motivate you at all no 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 i you know if 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 your business was to go out and stand in front of an audience you you would under, you know you'd have that natural and uh, perfect connection with it. and if it wasn't working you'd know You'd have no, if, if you didn't have the audience, you'd have no, if you weren't winning the audience, you would have no illusion about it. You would go home to your bed that night, have five whiskeys and cry yourself to sleep. <laughs> but, uh, but we don't know. We go on for year after year and we, we never know. You know. We may sell this number of copies, but every single one of them may have started the book and never finished it. We, we will never find out. We, <laughs> especially in the last year and two, was it two years now where all the conventions and festivals have been canceled? Um, we, we've, now we really have lost contact with, you know, there, there, there was those, the occasional moments where somebody would come up to your table at a convention where you were sitting signing, and, and tell and tell you that 
their favourite line from from one of your books, and and you and you go home feeling good about it, and you think, well, maybe maybe it's worthwhile after all. You would think to yourself, <laughs> it's this is something me and Sean have talked about because we have both played music, Sean more actively than me. But the immediate high of performing in front of an audience versus just the kind of miserable state of a project like this, by the time it comes out, like I've looked at proof copies of this book so many times now, I can't even read it anymore. So it's this thing I really wanted to see. And then by the time it gets to me as a physical object or a book, yeah, there's no connection to the audience. It's it's not an interesting object to me anymore, other than like, is anything messed up? <laughs> um, it's it's a very, and the same with painting, you know, I you live with the thing for two months and at some point you put the final stroke on it and you walk across the room and you go, yeah, that's about it. And then you're like, oh, but I could do better on the next one. So there's, I, I get that there is no immediate feedback and it's um, yeah, it's a weird way to work. Sometimes I'm working on a panel, on a figure, on a face and Years ago, I, I've just done a face, which I, I've spent two days. Uh, it's, a, it's one face and a panel. I, I've done it five times. Two days, of, three days have been wasted on this. And what is driving me is that when I look at, I, because I'm the, I'm the audience, when I look at this two years from now, I will weep. No, <laughs> I've got to do it again. The, the, the average reader probably won't think about it. So, so I, I, re, I really am the reader because I'm thinking, when I look at this a year, two years from now, will I, will I, will I cry? Will I, will I be able to bear it? I must, I must redo it. It's got to be better. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to me that you think that way, because that, that implies that you're going back and looking at it frequently enough. For me, a lot of times it's like, yeah, finish that. And then like my interest in it, in looking at it ever again is pretty low. And then maybe 10 years later, I'll pull out like, oh, what did I do in high school? And then I'll look back. And usually I'm actually like, oh, wow, I used to be so good at this one type of thing that as I've gotten better at everything else, I find that I, I lost something along the way. But it's not an active thing for me. It's pretty active for you to be looking at things over and over. Mm hmm. Ah, yeah, but that it, sounds like a burden. <laughs> a burden. Yeah. Uh, my mother took my mother took up uh, watercolors in 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 her retirement, and she would talk to me about the, the therapeutic value of painting, of art, the therapeutic value of art, and and she's I see it now. I I I, I said, good grief! No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's terrifying. It, it, there is there is no joy in it. There's no happiness that comes out of this. Yeah, I I used to call it uh, the demon bitch that had her claws in me because of the obsessive need to do it. I I think I'm getting past that a little bit where I can do it more for pleasure now. Maybe that's just because I've been working on someone else's stuff for a while, but it. Yeah, in my experience in like graduate school and stuff, the, the people who make it that far up into art have something that they're struggling with and the art is the way of, of getting to that. We're getting bleak. Uh, Sean, David <laughs> David Royal asked, will Living the Line be an ongoing comic book publisher with future projects? Well, geez, that depends on if uh, Eddie's going to talk me out of it. Uh, how about I announce something and we'll see if uh, you can wrestle it away from me. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love it to be so, and um, I uh, have tentative plans for, um, believe it or not, a monthly comic book uh, somewhere in the vicinity of late spring or uh, summer of next year. And uh, all I can have for you right now is a title called Great Big Stars. Um, Great Eddie, is that, a terrible, is that a terrible idea? What was the title again? Great Big Stars. Oh, Great Big Stars. And you are writing and illustrating this because we've talked about it a bit. That that is the that is the plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, I need I need Eddie's advice though because uh... yeah, sounds good. Leave me. Out of <laughs> <laughs> I've seen I've seen some sketches and I I say do it. I've seen the the general plot of it. 
And yeah, we're, we're, yeah, the, we will all benefit from, uh, we'll all benefit from that book being made for sure. It's certainly my uh, intention to continue to be a uh, publisher uh, going forward. The main things to sort of, you know, suss out are uh, basically everything happens at a glacier pace um, on in publishing. And, uh, you know, you have to have anything very minimum of four months in advance and uh, trying to juggle all of that while um, trying to figure out what it is exactly that you are interested in publishing uh, is a uh, is, is a, a long process, let's say. And uh, so, yeah, I'm definitely open to publishing other stuff. Um, it, it's a fairly intimidating prospect to try to follow up uh, Strange Death of Alex Raymond, which I'm, you know, I think is a, a very sophisticated and uh, fairly stunning uh, work and it's fairly unique. Uh, and so I, I would like to have something that is equally interesting, but fairly different uh, as a follow-up. And a lot more work to be taking on. Like I, I've seen how much you're doing just with this book. And like, I'm trying to help as much as I can to get Strange Death out and all of the stuff we're going through. I cannot imagine at the same time trying to be, and same same with what Dave did on Cerebus. Oh, I, Eddie... I cannot imagine writing and drawing a monthly comic book and handling all the publishing side. Um, Ed, Eddie, you you were a publisher for uh, six years? How, eight how, eight, how, eight, eight, eight years. years. Put out something every month for eight years, yeah. Incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, Bacchus, uh, great book. And uh, I, I, I'm, or, you know, it's, it's tremendous yeah. that you were able to put that together. It was Dave Sim that talked me into <laughs> being a self-publisher. Um, in fact, I haven't seen Dave, Dave since those days. Do uh, do say hello to him for me if you're uh, next time you're talking to him. Yeah, it'll Eddie, be my fax machine, but I will. <laughs> Eddie, am I misremembering that he was the one who introduced you to drawing with the nib pen? No, I've been no, I've been doing that already, but um, he <laughs> he is. I remember once he's. I I I, I developed this particular way of of of, of um, uh, very quickly doing these lines, very very fine lines that were so fine. Sometimes they look like just like a a shimmer of silver in the background of a panel. Then I remember Dave being quite impressed with them, and I said. Those are called the etc. lines. You draw one, and then you go etc. 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 And so <laughs> you've got a whole wave of, of, of perfectly um, aligned, fine, fine lines. So, how long ago was that? That's interesting was, because was that that obsession with fine, fine lines is such a big part of Strange Death of Alex Raymond. It's interesting that he was watching that already yeah yeah um dave stuff dave stuff really got quite a fine and intric intricate when when gerhard came on board and i don't just mean the backgrounds but gerhard's presence seemed to cause dave to uh dave's lines to become finer and finer mm -hmm. and a competition competitive spirit and you, you must, it must have been a real challenge to resurrect those uh, very fine cross hatches for, for the for the reprints. Yeah, cer certain choices that uh, were made at the very beginning uh, are, are basically what enabled that to, to take place in terms of the resolution of the the final images and things like that. Uh, definitely spent a long time looking at the entirety of the series and saying, "How fine did they go here? What is it that I actually need to be able to do in order to reproduce everything?" Um, it, it with the fine lines that you've gotten, Eddie, because that, that's a, a part of Strange Death at Ox Raymond is the bumping up against the limits of reproduction technology. And it's something me and Sean continue to talk about a lot. Um, when you've seen your work in print, was that distressing to you when you were doing those etc. lines? Were they reprinting the way you wanted them? Were they filling in? <laughs> They were printing well. I remember when, later when I, 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 I met with the, the printer and uh, 
And I said, that's great that it photographs right. And he says, oh, sometimes we have to do two or three negatives for every page and then cut them together. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> All the time I thought it was photographing correct. But so he you said, were working with someone who actually cared. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that was the days. Those were the days. But he said, but don't you worry about it. That's our problem. <laughs> you just you draw the pages and, and we'll figure out how to how to make them print. Mm. Yeah, they did a tremendous amount of post production work at uh, Printy Print and Litho. Uh, you know, people think about the the pre digital age as if it was crude, but um, mm. you know the tremendous amount of uh, skill and uh, you know someone would apprentice for all of those jobs and and uh, you know a lot of that craft is being forgotten. Yeah, he completely. And unfortunately, wasn't being done on the on the Rip Kirby's and the part of Julia Jones and all the artists we were looking at, which is part of the story, right? Like those guys didn't have time to do that. It was for weekly newspaper reproduction. So they're just, they're just taking one photograph and adjusting for as much as they can get. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting to hear that. It's, but it's also good when you compare the original art to what, to the, the print job that we're, we're getting. And I think as Dave says in the book, what, what made them persist? How did knowing that this was never going to print properly? How, how, why did Raymond persist with, with, with the perfectionism you know, of those perfect fine lines? Yeah, that's probably a bigger mystery to me, <laughs> right? Than the strange death that you didn't, they didn't adapt. Like Stan Drake, as he goes, you look at later hearted Julia Jones stuff. Um, I, I read that he's talking about well the pins didn't hold up as well so he couldn't he couldn't get the fine lines anyways but he was also drawing Blondie at the same time and um, you know I, I do see I, I wonder if Alex Raymond would have still been going in the 70s would it have held up I mean to me the best work he's done in his life is the stuff that happens when he dies so he seems just kind of a relentless uh, self-improvement but i wonder how long that could have held up um you know would would there have been a diminishment uh craig fisher has a, another observation he says that's one big difference between dave's art and eddie's eddie has embraced digital mark making to a great degree in his recent work and definitely true uh, yes 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 i um uh, i i I'm always trying to. I'm always trying to find the line, a line that is an authentic statement. And I became very disenchanted with the kind of lines I used to be drawing with with the crow quills. They they, they looked like more or less well crafted lines, but to me they, they were no longer speaking truthfully. They were like uh, like they were speaking in some ancient tongue that nobody can translate anymore. I I wanted. <laughs> I, I wanted to draw a line that was immediate and of our moment of today. And more and more I'm finding that the kind of line that that I'm wanting to draw, I can do it simply, not even using a, a, the, the stylus on the, the you know the wake on, on the tablet. I, I'm much happier just using my finger on the touchpad. Mm. And uh, and I'll put the lines down, and then I'll try to make them look less like marks made on a t <laughs> on a touchpad. And I look at the work of we were talking about uh, you and I, Sean, yep. the work of Ali Brosh, hyperbole um, and a half, yeah, yeah. And she unashamedly, unabashedly draws with her finger on the touchpad those those, those lines exactly as they come. And I, I'm looking at them so fresh and unpretentious and innocent and i'm thinking i wish i could draw a line like that and um it's interesting that as, as we become crotchety old artists we become obsessed with a line like dave trying to reproduce a, a line uh, the kind of line they did 60 years ago or something but but every a line is like japanese calligraphers or something trying to uh make a mark make a, a single mark that, that that contains all the wisdom of the universe or, or something like that like it's all going to be in this one line and this, i have to make this one line speak profoundly with with the move to the digital um have you gotten more interested in shape 
I, I find that um, lately, yeah, Strange as Alex Raymond pu pushed me towards that calligraphic sensibility. And, and there's a part of me that's still chasing that down. Like I, I think I've told the story to Sean before, but I was inking a, a page in Strange Death of Alex Raymond and it was the same image over and over like 20 times. And instead of statting it, I, I was trying to get into the calligraphic mindset and do each one. And I hit the perfect eyebrow where you draw the eyebrow once, you know, it's just one mark and it's the perfect eyebrow. And I like shouted in the middle of the conversation and I got obsessed yeah. with that calligraphic mark making. But um, I'm now thinking a lot more because of the digital medium about shape and working in shape rather than line. Is that something that as you move to digital because of vector graphics and things like that, or do you just not mess with, with that? No, no, very often, how I work is kind of back to front. I, I, I don't draw a, a shape, a figure. I don't draw a figure and then color it. I actually create color shapes and I, I, I carve them and uh, manipulate them until they are the shape of the thing I want. And mm -hmm. Then I may, I may draw a line around it, or I may not. I may just let it sit on top of a, of a, of a, of a background or butt up against another shape. But more and more, yeah, I'm thinking about shape. I'm getting away from line. The, the line. the line might be the last thing I think about in a picture. It's, it's certainly not the first thing. I, I, I've, I've I arrived at a kind of carving technique where I, I, I lay down a big shape of grey and then carve it into the figure, you know, by, by trimming off the edges or hollowing out the middle or, until I've got the thing I want. And if it's a shaggy mess, then I, I'll have to trace or trace a line over it. To, <laughs> to, well, you know, I, that's, that's interesting because it's the same... But that's Same the way I, that I'm encountering yeah. a little bit. But you you painted quite a bit as well, like some of the yeah I I, I painted before I I was much happier painter than I was a, a drawer. I, I, I color I start with the color. I don't do the color. To me, the color I make the picture out of colors. I don't do a drawing and then color it in. I I think in a painterly way. As, uh, as art tradition and art schools will we differentiate between painting and drawing. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was interested because even your line work has a painterly quality to it. It's, it's or it, especially in From Hell, it's so like Turner, it's so atmospheric and painterly and, and foggy almost. Yeah, I, I wrote about this somewhere once where um, the since everything in, in From Hell is, is, a, is, is mystery and, and unknowable, and I, was, I felt that the challenge was to, to draw in a style that was deniable. It was imprecise. and it, 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 Everything is deniable. Um, and as you say, it, it, it's, it's coming out of a fog. So things are more deniable or less deniable. We, we might know more about this part here. Um, uh, so it's it's never like a it's never like a child's drawing where I, so I, I somewhere recently somebody tweeted that their their child had just described drawing and she says I see a picture in my I see a thing in my head and I draw a line around it. That was a Which, child describing the act of drawing. Sean, we were just talking about that the other day. <laughs> literally, literally a few, yeah, three days ago. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's, you're, yeah, you're, you're, the deniability thing is very interesting. And I, I noticed that the first chapter of From Hell, uh, one of the revisions that you made uh, was to clear away some of the, on a particular panel, um, the act of a, uh, of a royal family member in Congress, uh, shall we say, uh, <laughs> is, Covered over, covered over in the original edition with hatching, um, a storm of uh, of hatching, and uh, you've wiped most of that away. Uh, Have I? Yeah, <laughs> I, I was, I, <laughs> I'll send you the panel. I was very interested to see it. Um, <laughs> I'll have to go back and look. Because I, of the Congress, <laughs> I felt more confident about drawing his arse. 
There you go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the that that scene is is highly comic. It's uh, it, it, it it's a comical and and, and funny scene. It's uh, yeah. The sex scenes in From Hell are kind of human and funny. And I, I, I think sex should, we should draw sex funny like it is in real life, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes, yes. <laughs> is, uh, is the deniability of the image harder when you're moving to color and in shape? Or do, do you find that you can enhance the deniability? Or is it is it a challenge to preserve that? Um, no, no, it's not harder because my, I was talking about learn, what, what, and then learning to colour and learning to paint in Photoshop, to, to paint in, in with washes. Uh, I, I couldn't see that happening in anybody's colouring. I just assumed you couldn't paint that, you couldn't colour that way in Photoshop in a painterly way. So, so it was a bit, and I couldn't colour from, from hell until I'd, learn to use photoshop in a painterly manner mm -hmm. that makes sense to, um, uh, in the comments alan dorn has asked have we talked about the writing process yet um i don't think we covered that too much but i i don't know that any of us are privy enough to that to comment I, alan, voluminous I voluminous script notes Alan. Yeah, I would actually like to compare what Eddie got for one page to what I got in the annotations of a page just to see. <laughs> yeah, with, with Alan Moore, you could write, you could write, um, sometimes you'd write a couple of thousand words to describe um, a page. Sometimes you write a thousand words to describe one picture. Yeah. Uh, but once he got rolling, it, was, it wasn't always as... Is as big as that, but uh, he knew he, he knew exactly what he wanted. He drew a little, his working method was to draw a little thumbnail picture and then describe what he was seeing. So he knew it would fit into a picture because he just drawn it, and then he would describe in detail what he was seeing. That was Alan's method. Yes. Yeah, so the writing on Strange of Alex Raymond. And what I got was odd, probably compared to most things. There was no script. There was photo. There was faxed basically photo collages. So Dave would do all the research and basically design the whole page, make all the word balloons, and put the dialogue into the word balloons, and then send that to me as a photo collage, and then send me files of all the photos, and I would recreate that in Photoshop for my purposes. So I was basically getting a finished image of a page, it was just my job to turn that into a pen and ink drawing. But along with those, um, later on, early in the book, I would just get those and that was about it. So there was no script. L later on in the process, um, I would get some technical notes and then sometimes like 16, 17 pages of annotations trying to explain to me the meta, what he calls metaphysical, what I would call metatextual resonances that he was seeing. And this would often be like long descriptions of how these things related to the, the Bible. And, you, you know, this is the kind of stuff that will be on the, the online annotation site, I'm assuming, because he's asked that we not ask if we could publish those. And he said, no, those are for the, the website. So that will be thousands and thousands of pages of commentary um on on the old strips that he was looking at the commentary that i got sent so i would get big things but uh, I, I don't know eddie how much of that you like read it all or i got to the point where it's like well i don't really need to know how this panel relates <laughs> to the book of genesis so i'm just gonna go ahead and draw the draw the thing he sent as an image yeah um it's like no you could know too much <laughs> A did, lot of did you? a lot of Dave's commentary about uh, about the images would be uh, it's, it's so granular it really gives him a lot it gives you a lot of insight into his thought process when he was drawing the earlier segments of the book, mm -hmm. uh, especially when he directed some of the things to you like well you should use a certain type of Raymond hatching for this part because you're attempting to communicate that 
you know, he, he didn't like spell it out like exactly, but he, you know, he was very specific that the visual is communicating subconsciously to the person who is receiving it and that you should have the information on that particular visual. Yeah. Very, like that, that, the, that the, the marks that go from a 45 degree angle from bottom left to top, right. Raymond would have done in a brush. And then the ones that, that head the other way on the crosshatch were done in a, a nib pin, <laughs> You know, those kind of technical notations, that stuff I paid attention to. Um, I don't know that I necessarily followed all of it because yeah. like it, what's comfortable for my hand and Raymond's hand was was different. Um, like if I could reproduce a look with the brush, I might just keep doing that. But yeah, th those were the kind of things that I got when when, when I got left with the book uh, to finish it myself. Then I worked a bit like Dave. The, the writing happened with the collaging, but I was doing it in Photoshop rather than by hand. So I kind of had a sense of, okay, this is the topic for the two page spread. Here's all the images that I need to cover that to or that I want to cover while covering that topic. And then I just found where the word balloons would fit and see what, what I could say that fit within them. So that was easier and that was surprisingly fast. It, uh, it almost scared me a little bit like that sen it, that sense of predestination that's already in the book like oh man this page wrote itself that's kind of creepy or or resonances i didn't even see until all the pictures are on the screen and it was like oh crap i didn't realize that was there so it wrote itself a little bit well um i'm afraid that we're gonna have to wrap this up or um we have already gone uh, well past our allotted time, uh, but uh, gentlemen, uh, it's a real pleasure to speak with both of you guys and, and thanks so much for agreeing to do this. And I hope, um, Eddie, uh, at some point, uh, we, all three of us can get together and have a talk about another book. Um, we would just, uh, I, I personally just uh, really appreciate both of you guys, you know, giving so generously of your time and thoughts. and. Um, uh, please, anyone who's listening to this, uh, check out uh, From Hell Master Edition. Uh, it came out last year from Top Shelf, and uh, it's just a fantastic uh, edition of a fantastic book, uh, Eddie's new book uh, that he's working on. I'm very excited about that. And then um, from Living the Line, uh, Carson Grubas, co-author and uh, co-artist of The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, which is going to be coming out the first week of August. Gentlemen, do you have anything else that you want to share with the class? No, for me, but it's been great talking with you guys. Um, I wish I could have seen your faces. <laughs> Next <Yeah>. time, perhaps. <laughs> Likewise, it, it's an honor to meet you. I, I've been a, a fan for a long time, so it's really fun to talk, and I am a bit bummed that we didn't get to see each other's faces. So, yeah, I, I hope we we can continue to, continue to talk. Uh, but it, it was a total pleasure for me uh, geeking out a little bit. It's great. Thanks so much to Diamond to Book Distribution, and thank you, Ashley, for uh, running the session, and thank you for the American Library Association for uh, having us at this year's conference. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, and I hope that everybody has a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thank you.